So can I ask you please all to take your seats again? So we are moving on. We didn't really have uh, a break scheduled between these two panels. So please, please find a seat um, or at least stop talking. <laughs> all right, so welcome. It has been an exciting afternoon, I must say. I'm really enjoying this a lot, so I am having fun with these panels and seeing you know, students from many years back. My name is Martin Stute, and I actually taught as an adjunct some classes here in 1993, and then was hired as an uh, assistant professor in 95. So I have been around also for a long time. You know, I can't compete with Peter, but um, I'm getting, getting there. <clears throat> uh, so from knowledge to action, this is actually something that um, in our sort of research directions in the department, we have kind of moved into a little bit. So we are, I think, more, have become more applied over the years with really trying to solve problems. But what I wanted to point out is also that the students tell us, you know, you, you teach us in, our, in these classes about all these problems, right? Uh, tell us something about solutions and tell us how we can get involved, right? So in response to that, we, um, Stephanie designed a class called Responding to Climate Change, which goes a little bit into this direction, but it's still in the classroom atmosphere, classroom environment. But we also started a class called a Workshop on Sustainable Development, where students actually are working for a real-world client on a real-world problem that they're supposed to solve in the class. So they basically form a consulting firm uh, they are quite independent, um, they have their own manager, they, are, they use sort of standard business practices to get uh, the project going, and they work for an outside client on, this, on a solution to a problem. So I think we are go going in this direction and trying to meet that demand from the students. So this is going to be our theme, from knowledge into action, and we have uh, four fantastic speakers here today. And our first speaker is um, Alicia Lehrer, and uh, she actually graduated from Barnard before my time, uh, 1988. <clears throat> and she was already at the time very much involved in action, and she was actually the head of the Columbia's Earth Coalition, right? which was sort of... I can't believe you know that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you. I am so excited to be here today with all of our future leaders and all of our existing leaders. It's just such a great place. I just want to tell you that when I um, came to Barnard, I came as a, a pre-med and got weeded out quickly when it came to organic chemistry. And I looked at every single major in the book and I decided, well, maybe environmental science was for me. And at the time, the department was two people. It was um, Richard Bopp and Peter Bauer. And I met with Richard Bopp and I said, I I'm thinking about being in your department. And he said, you want to be in my department? <laughs> like, he was so excited about it. And I, <laughs> and I just want you to know, like, if you haven't been in this career for a while, the, in, the whole environmental field is like that. We are all very welcoming. We are all very collaborative people. We're in this because we, we want to make a difference and we want to do it together. So congratulations for choosing this field. So right out of college, I moved to Providence, Rhode Island, and I got the best job in the world. It was bathing beach monitor at, in the ocean state. We had a 1,000 bathing beaches, and I got to go out every day to another bathing beach and test the water there. I worked as an intern for the Department of Environmental Management. I thought, how good is this? I went, I love this field. <laughs> and I also um, worked right outside of a river. Uh, my office was right outside of a river. It was called the Wunasquatucket. And it is the main urban river that runs through the city of Providence, Rhode Island. And one of the guys who I was working with said, pointed it out to me. He said, that's the Wunasquatucket River. This is 1988. He said, it's really polluted. It's kind of a lost cause. I believed him at the time, but we will come back to that. Um, I got my uh, graduate degree at the University of Rhode Island in natural resources science, but before that, I did a couple of years in the laboratory, and I'm grateful for that because it taught me what environmental measurements meant 
how they were tested, how they were analyzed, but it also taught me that I did not belong in the laboratory. Um, I love to be with a million people, as many as possible, all the time, and environmental organizing was the right field for me. So, as soon as I graduated um, from grad school, it was 1994, and at that time, this is, this is just, you know, my whole life is foreshadowing for the rest of my life, right? So 1994 was the same time that the organization I currently work for first moved into this neighborhood of Providence, Onlyville, was the poorest neighborhood of Providence, most degraded, no green space. This is a site called Riverside Mills. And Riverside Mills was um, part of the Industrial Revolution. It was a textile mill in the 1860s. It was functioning until the 1970s, when uh, afterwards it burned to the ground in the 80s, then burned to the ground in the 90s, and was left neglected. It had the highest crime rate in the area. It was 3% of police service uh, area, but 30% of the calls. The only thing to do at Riverside Mills was drugs and prostitution. Nobody even wanted to go there. Okay, just keep that in mind because we're going to move on. But I wanted to talk about what I got out of the environmental science department here. So first of all, I knew that I needed to learn more lab skills because at the time, I. Most of you who are there now have actual laboratories. But in 1987 and 88, we kind of had a makeshift lab and we'd pull together whatever materials we could find and do lab science. Um, so I knew I needed to get more lab experience and I learned that here. I also got an understanding of natural systems, um, clean water, flooding, and what I bring today that I've learned from it is working on the issue of climate change. Now, lots of people have brought that up, but you know, it's in all of our faces. And working on a river in an urban community, climate change is a very real thing. Flooding is a huge issue. Uh, we've had many floods in my watershed. We've washed out bridges, washed out roads, displaced people, displaced businesses. So that is a big deal for what I'm working on. And I first learned about climate change right here. Um, and I, it was another Cynthia Rosenzweig class at the time. And I was hoping it wasn't real in 1988. And you know, so now I'm working on, well, now what do we do about it? Um, what I wish I had learned at Barnard that I didn't learn was grant writing, budgeting, staff management, IT. <laughs> stamina, um, but I'm going to say that the most important thing that you can probably do, whether you think you're ready for it or not, is speak. I speak to everybody all the time about everything that I'm doing. And um, as a result, people start coming to me saying, I heard your idea about building green infrastructure and I want to participate and I have a grant. I'm like, what? Really? You want to give me money to do this? This is fantastic. So that's, that's the other reason that I'm in nonprofit. Because if you're in nonprofit and you have a good idea and you can sell it to somebody, you can do it. It doesn't really matter what it is. But, you know, with a science background, I want to do the right thing. So I started a campaign. Uh, called Nature at Work. It's not just me. I'm part of a coalition of 50 organizations in Rhode Island called the Green Infrastructure Coalition. And a lot of our wonderful last speakers talked about communication. We knew that if we talked about green infrastructure to the general public and why we need it in our urban watersheds, they would just look at us cross-eyed. Because even in the field, we don't all agree what green infrastructure is. So we've decided to call this campaign Nature at Work. And we created these signs that are actually now used all over Rhode Island every time there is an installation using green plants and soils to treat storm, storm water and um, to prevent flooding. So I have to move quick because he's timing me. Um, but <laughs> 
Anyway, okay, so remember this picture now. This is 1994, Onlyville neighborhood of Providence. This is the exact same place today. We have um, seven miles of greenway and bike path that started that site. We run a bike camp program out of that site. There are playgrounds, a picnic area, community garden, fish ladders, safe places for kids and families to play. We bring 500 students out there every year to get in touch with what is nature in our urban backyard. So, you know, from this to this is kind of a miracle, but just to show you that anything is possible, and I hope you'll create anything that's possible for you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, our next speaker is um, Salima Jones Daly, and she was an urban studies major, uh, but we still saw her a lot in our department, right? <laughs> I mean, it was a very common uh, appearance there, which is great. And she um, actually worked with Cynthia Rosenzweig, who has been mentioned several times from NASA GIS, who still teaches in the department, actually this semester, her class about uh, agriculture and um, land use, and uh, inspired a lot of students in the past. And um, we actually dug out Salima's senior seminar poster. It's hanging over there, you know, you can look, check it out. She worked on... Very surprising on to see. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. And um, it, it, it had to do with actually the flooding of New York City, um, if you imagine, you know, major storm events. And then a few years later, um, we had Hurricane Sandy, right? So it was a good prediction. And a lot of what she found out in that poster, she actually happened. Yeah, yeah. It Okay. I think it's even, <laughs> oh, put the timer on, yep. Uh, it, it, it's actually a little bit emotional to see that just given what occurred in Puerto Rico recently, in particular, the storm. And, uh, and the title of uh, my senior thesis is The Vulnerability of Brownfields in New York City to Climate Change and Sea Level Rise. And uh, with the brownfields and Superfund sites that exist in Puerto Rico, I understand the flooding has actually uh, resulted in the travel of contaminants um, uh, across you know, space uh, within Puerto Rico, and it further compromises their accessibility to clean water. So, um, yeah, what, what you research really matters, uh, and, and what you do with that research in terms of uh, communicating uh, the risks uh, to community members, to decision makers, uh, is really important and timely, particularly now when we're seeing these events uh, become more frequent. Um, so with that, um, I graduated in 2003, and as Martin mentioned, as an urban studies and environmental science major, um, and I really took my time here to really uh, use my research to get to understand uh, my interest and in what I may do with that information going forward. So um, I participated in the research experience for undergraduates at the University of Idaho, where I worked with an agricultural engineer and uh, dabbled in hydrology and GIS and was able to further uh, my study here towards my thesis um, between now and then. Uh, I also worked for uh, at least two years as Peter's research assistant. May have been a bit longer, and along with taking almost all of his classes. And, um, and really used uh, one urban studies class in particular uh, to learn more about the community, uh, the Brooklyn community where I'm from, East New York, uh, which manages the East Brooklyn Industrial Zone, uh, which was basically my backyard. So um, I grew up uh, on the edge of this industrial zone and in another home that I lived in was surrounded by vacant lots on a site which used to hold a, a Catholic church that burned down a few years ago. And uh, needless to say, I, ha I was very sensitive to my environment. I, I experienced terrible allergies and ha was blessed to have the opportunity to go to boarding school where I was basically transported into a different uh, environment, a more natural environment surrounded by the Estabrook Woods and took on cross-country running and uh, was really uh, somewhat fearful of that exposure because I knew how I react to trees and grass um, in my uh, New York City experience, but really faced that exposure 
head on as a way of uh, just if, if any of you have allergies, you know that if, if uh, you took shots or so forth, the treatment was to um, uh, expose you little with small doses of what you were allergic to to build a resistance, right? Um, but in my uh, experience in, in boarding school, I was surrounded by day in and day out. And after a few years of being there, of course, I overcame my allergies and just that uh, sensory exposure um, just led me to want to understand uh, the human relationship uh, to the environment further. And so I knew in coming to Barnard College that I would use my time, my studies, to uh, access uh, organizations that were doing work within that area to understand more. So my first um, in, uh, internship with, in taking a, a community building class with this Ab Liz Absa, um, allowed me access to the Local Development Corporation of East New York uh, that managed that industrial park. And I got to understand my community better and its environmental needs and uh, being, uh, it was able to be part of a, a few solutions. So I was um, exposed to food access as a primary uh, need within the area, which was uh, also juxtaposed with the understanding that East New York had the highest density of community gardens within New York City. So it was about leveraging what was a community asset uh, to provide additional uh, access to fresh foods and vegetables to the community residents. And so with that, uh, through the LDC of East New York, I partnered with um, uh, the Just Food and uh, a regional farmer, uh, a W. Rogowski Farm, to form a CSA within the, uh, within the East New York neighborhood. And after that internship as an assignment for my community building class, um, I was hired by the LDC of East New York to actually manage the farmer's market where the CSA would be sited. Um, so with that, I, I maintained this relationship with the organization and continued to use that relationship towards my studies. As I mentioned, I participated in REU the previous summer and uh, had worked with in hydrology and GIS and so decided to pursue this uh, research in sea level rise in brownfields, which uh, married nicely with uh, this, the, the work that uh, the industrial zone aspect of um, uh, the work the organization uh, was doing at the time. And um, with Cynthia as my advisor, and Martin was certainly helpful in helping me identify uh, the GIS um, uh, teachers across the street to make this happen, um, I further uh, understood uh, what the vulnerabilities of this coastal area of Brooklyn were. Um, and in being hired to the, for the organization full time thereafter, uh, did help and didn't participate in, but did help that organization receive a Brownfields grant um, if, if through New York City. So what I, I would say that the majority of my work with that organization expanded within uh, food access, food justice, and um, I went on to uh, organized a, a food co-op within the area, worked on other projects, research projects around clean air, um, and of course uh, with this brownfield opportunity that they worked on thereafter. Uh, other research opportunities uh, became available um, being within this uh, community, uh, this red line community, uh, to better understand and provide um, resources to, to ameliorate the exposure that uh, this community was experiencing. Um, another was uh, a Clean Air Acts, um, or Clean Air Project with uh, waste management um, to basically educate the business owners within the area that had fleets of how to retrofit these uh, vehicles to reduce NOx emissions and just keep up with the clean air requirements uh, um, you know, that, that expanded within that time. I did go on from there to receive a master's in environmental management from Yale FES, and uh, received a degree in urban ecology and environmental design. Uh, Marion Chertow was actually my advisor there, who was also a Barnard graduate, and her specialization is in industrial ecology. Uh, so she focused more on engineering work, but I was able to glean from uh, her teachings just uh, the collaborative efforts uh, that, uh, and from the program as well, uh, that are required to make change happen. Okay. 
And with one minute, wow, time goes really fast. Um, so there I maintain my relationship with um, working with community groups on sustainable food projects and also in planting trees as uh, Diane uh, was speaking about in the first panel um, to further help that community understand what their capabilities were and understand their values, what was important to them, uh, which was in beautifying that community and being able to marry that with um, instead of gardening, having a more uh, perennial perspective on things and planting fruit trees as well. So there was additional value uh, in that project that was added. Um, so since then, since time is over, <laughs> um, uh, I am working right now as a management consultant. And so in my graduation from local to regional and national work and get, allowing myself to still learn through my clients and how industry uh, and manufacturing really is a cornerstone of uh, the US economy is really important um, in terms of just managing our resources and being responsible and accountable in our consumption and use. So as a management consultant, it's really more of a behavioral um, approach to uh, efficiency, and so indirectly having an environmental impact and helping them identify opportunities to be more efficient and to reduce waste. Uh, I, I complement that work with uh, being on a board member to the National Young Farmers Coalition, in which um, basically as a board member, I'm pretty much an advisor and looking to network on behalf of the organization, but really there's a critical need to in increase the population of farmers as it is an Asian community and only right now I believe about 2% of uh, the, the jobs within this country are from farmers with 1% contributing to uh, the GDP of the US. So uh, through that, uh, the mission is to ensure their success and to provide them with the resources, skills, and whatever is needed uh, to ensure that it's a diverse uh, and knowledgeable community so that we can maintain, sustain, and even create a resilient next generation. There was a recent uh, survey of farmers that was completed in which we expect to, um, to, to, to contribute to work that would help them be resilient in the midst of climate change. We expect to contribute to work that would further ensure that this is a diverse group of farmers. So when we're thinking about environmental equity um, and land access and resources and otherwise. And so I do encourage you to uh, take a look at our website. I have a few business cards in front of my desk. I just wanted to, to uh, make sure I didn't forget to put those out there. And um, to take a look at youngfarmers.org and just look forward to that study that will come out in a month or so. Um, to see how you may participate in more ways than one in uh, this research that, that is being summarized uh, right now. And of course, looking forward to the Farm Bill in 2018. So um, if anything, just get involved, explore your interests, create those opportunities. If not, uh, find ways to balance your interests with whatever your own uh, financial <laughs> needs are and opportunities are at the moment. You can certainly do that in more ways than one. Thank you very much. Yes, our next speaker is Hannah Roth, also an urban studies major. <clears throat> and while she was here at Barnard, she actually was part of two Columbia community organizations, right? So she was a community organizer. She works now for a very large community, the city of New York, on transportation, which certainly needs a lot of help. So we're hoping you're doing a really good job. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, you heard from our commissioner, Polly Trottenberg, earlier. I'm a, a attorney and assistant general counsel at the New York City Department of Transportation. And because I'm a lawyer, I just have to start out by saying that this is these are all personal reflections and not reflective of my agency or the administration or anyone else. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to give you a little quick sense of what it is that I do as a lawyer and why it makes any sense at all that I was an urban studies and environmental science major and now um, like basically an in-house counsel transportation lawyer. So first of all, as the commissioner told you earlier, we are streets, sidewalks, and the Staten Island Ferry, um, not the subways, but we do coordinate with the bus routes on the streets. 
we have over 5,000 employees and a multi-billion dollar budget every year. So although we are a local organization, we have a huge impact, um, both in terms of land use, policy, and law. As an assistant general counsel, I participate in everything from rulemaking to legislation drafting to legislation commenting. I'm currently working on comments for a variety of federal rules and legislation, as well as state and local rules and legislation. Um, I also do everything from employment law and human resources and just about everything. And one of the things that I love about my job is that I get to touch on a little bit of every kind of substantive area. It's a lot like when I was an urban studies and environmental science major. So the key things that I would say I got from my skills as an environmental scientist that I now use as a lawyer is basically that lawyers and scientists do a lot of the same things in the, the daily skill sets that we use. So before I was a lawyer, I worked for a little more than a year in Black Rock Forest full time, and I also was an intern there, and I know lots of people in the environmental science department are familiar with the forest, but it's 50 miles north of the city, west side of the Hudson, 4,000 acre preserve. And I did research and education there. So I had a little bit of the sciences before I moved on. So from that experience, I'll say that in both contexts, um, as a lawyer and a scientist, you spend a lot of your time issue spotting. You look around the world and you say, what's going on here? Why are we, what are we really doing? What do we really want to do? And how do we get there? And from a legal perspective, most of the questions I am asked on a daily basis are um, in two categories. One is, we think we've done something wrong and what do we do to fix it? And we'd really like to do something we're not sure we can. Can you help us figure out a way that we can do it the right way? And I think that's true in a lot of the sciences and the policy that a lot of us touch on. Um, when I worked in the forest, I worked on a bunch of really cool research with members of the faculty here and at a variety of institutions around the country and the world. And the questions that people would come to the forest to ask in these very small areas were, does this leaf take up more carbon than that leaf? Or, you know, does this portion of soil absorb more water than that one? Or how do these trees communicate using the fungal connections underground? You know, there were infinite questions being asked. And I think a lot of times when we get interdisciplinary degrees, people can say to us things like, well, what are you going to do with that? Or like, <laughs> you're taking a class called what? Um, and I would, I just always say to all of those questions, I'm learning how to ask the questions. You know, you can never learn all the skills. You know, in law school, it's three years. You can certainly not learn all the laws, right? You have no idea what you're going to be faced with on a daily basis, even if you are a subject matter expert. Um, what you learn is how to look it up, how to ask the questions, and how to, like, discover an answer. When I was an undergrad, um, I worked on a research project with the Columbia's Environmental Engineering, and we were doing a tracer study in the Hudson River. And so I spent a summer going back and forth, up and down the river, on a boat, holding equipment over the edge, looking at data. Um, and on my like, second day, I remember one of the scientists who was leading the, the project said to me, OK, so we need to measure this concentration of this tracer in the river. We're going to be taking transects up and down the river. Um, and we need to figure out where that tracer is going and how quickly and how much it's dispersing. And I was like, great, how are we going to do that? And he's like, well, you're going to figure out how to make a machine. And I was like, excuse me? I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do what? Um, and he let me sort of figure out this process. You know, I mean, he, we knew what the study was. I was given a lot of the tools, and I got to like sit down and figure out, okay, how do we get the water out of the machine? And it was a lot of hands-on, like, I worked with somebody who was like molding, grinding plastic, and all these other things just that I never had any exposure to. I had no idea what was going on. Um, and at the end, I felt such a strong sense of accomplishment. Like, if I could help build this machine, you know, and I could get that <laughs> SF6 out of the water, you know, like, how, what can't I do? And I realized, you know, in some ways this is like a very small piece of equipment. It was totally imperfectly designed. Um, but I learned so much from it. And I think every day, even though it's, it sounds so different, a lot of what I do is the same thing. You know, I'm asked a question. It's not always clear to me how to get to the answer. But I, if you take the time to sort of figure out why you're being asked and what the goal is, 
you can use the skills that you learned here at Barnard in all of your different classes, whether they be history or in environmental science, to sort of get to the key answers. Um, and so a couple more like how did I get there things, I would just say one of the things I always did was I, I always said yes to things when I was presented with the opportunity. So some of the internships I picked in, in college, you know, I picked because they sounded cool or because they were paid instead of unpaid and I knew I had to pay my own rent and for my own food. I wasn't getting a lot of family support so I had to, you know, make things work. So I wasn't as interested in, you know, like a nonprofit that wasn't going to pay my bills. But in science, there actually is a fair amount of money and for like very practical purposes, great opportunities, particularly for women to sort of harness these experiences if you're willing to say yes and sort of step outside of what you're used to. So I encourage you to say yes to all of those experiences and worry less about which hard skills and which expertise am I developing. Um, because as you have heard, I worked as a scientist in a forest and now I do transportation law. You know, like <laughs> not really connected, except it really is. And every step along the way, I was able to say how I got from one place to the other. Um, and the way I was able to do that is by paying attention in class and learning how to make those connections and ask the right questions. So although as the commissioner very nicely stated earlier, we as the city are in lots of ways hampered by federal and state overlays that um, don't give us as much flexibility as we lawyers sometimes wish that we had, um, we can do a lot and it's really fun to be in this creative small scale where we're really making a difference every day in the lives of New Yorkers from things as simple as um, a right-of-way law that we worked on changing last year that now um, pedestrians have greater right-of-way in certain contexts to working, as the commissioner said earlier, on electric vehicles uh, that are coming to curbside spaces in the city in the next couple of years. So that is my pitch for interdisciplinary knowledge to action. So our last speaker is Emily Spokowski, and uh, she worked with Joe Lidicott, who is sitting back there, actually, on some paleomac studies, mm -hmm. Mono Lake, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I really like Emily a lot. I uh, was her advisor, and you know, whenever she came to my office, I we both left with a smile. I had the feeling, <laughs> you know, she's a, she has this great sense of dry humor that I really appreciate. <laughs> So, well, go thank ahead. you, Martin. Wow, you're making me blush. <laughs> um, okay, well, hi everyone. I chose to study environmental science um, because, like many of you, the whole you know buzzword concepts of climate change, sustainability. I cared deeply about all those issues and wanted to do something to contribute to that cause. That's something I wasn't quite sure of what. Um, I'm not really sure what job you can put into a, a search engine for climate change or sustainability. Um, so I, after school, fell into this world that was completely unknown to me of um, environmental compliance. So I know a lot of people that have talked before me are all doing these incredible projects to how can we change to make things better, um, if we can. But it's important that also to make sure we're in compliance with the rules we still, we have, or at least still have. Um, and that's a huge, huge uh, industry. Um, my first two jobs are at two different uh, environmental consulting firms. And I don't, I didn't know what that was at all. I just, I answered a job for an uh, environmental scientist. <laughs> um, <laughs> But basically, every uh, construction project or renovation project, building purchase project, there are so many environmental rules involved that um, you need to be compliant with um, and take care of. For example, you can't renovate this unless you know it's not lead paint in the walls, you can't tear down a building if there's asbestos in it, um, if a company purchases a, a site, they're liable for any environmental pollution on site, so they need to make sure there's none before they buy it. Um, so, so many things. This job involved 
being on construction sites all day, hanging out in the freezing cold, um, taking like noise level readings or dust readings. Um, it, it involved uh, air sampling, drilling, pump, making pumps, all this crazy stuff. Um, Peter Bauer's class with the, the Brownfield action is real. That was my job. <laughs> <laughs> Except the people have less interesting names in real life. <laughs> um, but so um, I decided when I was in environmental consulting, I wanted to pivot a little bit away from that. I, as much as as fun as it is to wear a hard hat on the job, I did not like standing out in zero degree weather for eight hours a day. Um, so I enrolled at the CUNY School of Public Health. Um, like the theme has been, I really like the big picture issues and the thematic like need to collaborate between di different groups to achieve one bigger goal. Um, so there, um, I studied their environmental and occupational health track um, where I managed to then get a job with the city at the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and there I was on their internal auditing team for envir environmental health and safety of workers. So that's another aspect of the field. Instead of consulting, you're on site making sure people are safe or that we're not going to have you know, sodium hypochlorite explode and cause an environmental disaster. Um, but, um, and also just an aside for DP and uh, regulation compliance, it's incredible the amount of regulations that they have to uh, work around and their job is so, um, so impressive when you think about all the different things that involved with getting our water from upstate and transferring it down to New York City and then cleaning it and cleaning the uh, sewer system. It's an incredible job, but um, there is so much oversight and compliance that has to be involved with that as well. I did not do that. I did in, um, health and safety, but that's another um, compliance portion. Um, and then, um, afterwards, I just recently, about eight months ago, took a position with AIG. Um, I'm an insurance analyst for claims related to pollution insurance. So um, if someone has a property with um, leaking gas tanks or there was a former dry cleaners or uh, one place I had like... 60,000 gallons of molasses spill in Kentucky. Um, <laughs> lots of really weird stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so one thing, okay, so my time at Barnard that I really, the classes that I love the most um, or thought were most beneficial, I would say Definitely the intro class uh, because that's about consulting. It's also about you know, and this sense of justice for cleaning up, having ev having a clean environment for us all. Um, environmental law was extremely helpful. Um, I just took this licensing exam to be an insurance adjuster, um, and it, one of the questions was, "What is a tort?" <laughs> um, so that helped. Um, <laughs> um, and then um, Brian's water class. I, I really appreciated all the classes that looked at the big picture and put it on a practical level um, of how you can actually apply these things in the real world versus just doing a, an ex, you know, chemistry experiment or what, what not. Um, I also appreciated your environmental measurements class where we went on the sea wolf um, and did all some, some water sampling with that um, at, in graduate school my senior thesis, I mean my capstone thesis was um, the PCB pollution in the Hudson River um, and so that class helped with consulting with all my water analysis and understanding that as well as you know understanding 
water issues with my, uh, with my capstone. And so I guess that's it. I don't know. <laughs> you tell me. Okay, yes, that's it. Oh, thank you. <laughs>